Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here, Tread Athletics, and today we're gonna to be breaking down Spencer Strider. We're gonna look at his mechanics, his nutrition, his training regimen, and what he did to gain so much velocity after having Tommy John surgery in college. Stay tuned. So first, let's just recap a couple of quick facts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's listed at six foot 195. Personally, I think he looks a little bit bigger than that. Uh, we know those numbers are often wrong, so I would estimate maybe 200, 205 pounds, somewhere in there. So uh, not a huge guy from a lever standpoint, uh, but certainly uh, very strong, very filled out. We'll get into his training regimen. Uh, here in a second. Some other quick facts amongst starting pitchers with at least 10 starts so far this season. He's leading the league in FIP, K percentage, expected average, and effective velocity at 99.3 miles per hour. He's also number two in raw fastball velocity, second to only Hunter Green, and he's number four in the league with his fastball in terms of whiff percentage. Regarding his arsenal and how he utilizes it, his fastball is by far and away his very best pitch. He utilizes it over two thirds of the time, uh, going to his slider about 28% of the time. Uh, what makes his fastball unique? Just to recap, talked about this in other videos, specifically in regards to Jack Leiter, Craig Kimbrell, Jacob deGrom. He has what I would consider a triple threat fastball. So he doesn't just have one metric or variable that makes his fastball so effective, uh, but there's a number of different factors that, that come into play here. The first is obviously the high velocity, so averaging over 98 miles an hour, touching 102 plus miles an hour. The second being very high extension, so he's able to really get far down the mound and extend way out in front of the rubber, despite, again, not being a super tall guy with super long levers, he's able to really get out over his front side. And so that's what contributes to his effective velocity being over 99 miles an hour. He also has a high vertical approach angle, so the steepness uh, at which his fastball crosses the plate from release to where across the plate. Now, part of this takes into consideration the location of where he's throwing his fastball. He throws it up in the zone a lot, but he's also releasing it from relatively low release height. And so all this contributes to having a much flatter plane on his fastball versus a very steep downhill plane. He keeps a flat plane and it has this kind of additional rising effect. The next kind of threat to his fastball is high vertical break. So high induced vertical break. His fastball literally drops due to gravity less than the league average. So he's got a rising effect from there. He's got this uh, short reaction time the hitters have as a result of the, the velocity. He's got this additional perceived velocity from releasing it close to the plate. And then he has this flat, as far as steepness, this flat vertical approach angle, this very high vertical approach angle. So there's a number of different things all combining to make this such a good pitch. Uh, other pitchers that would have this would be someone like a Josh Hader, again, Craig Kimbrell, Jacob DeGrom, pitchers with very elite fastballs, a lot of times fall into this category. And they can have a lot of success up in the zone generating whiffs. Uh, when we look at his slider, again, his slider in isolation is a pretty solid pitch, but it really plays up when combined with his fastball. So on its own, it's somewhat of a gyro slider, getting about one inch of vertical break, a negative five of horizontal break, and throwing it about 86. So it does compare somewhat to Jacob deGrom's slider. However, it does have a couple more inches of depth, a couple more inches of sweep. Jacob deGrom, however, is throwing his slider about five miles an hour harder than Strider throws his. So while he's able to get a little bit more movement, you know, Jacob DeGrom in this case probably has the better pitch from a slider standpoint, but it's probably why he throws it more frequently than Strider. Um, so again, it just goes to show, even if you have a, a pretty solid pitch, but you have a really, really outlier plus pitch that you can pair it with, especially if those pitches tunnel and play off each other and you utilize them to proper locations, um, it can really help that kind of average or above average pitch play up to plus when you have a plus pitch to go along with it. So really simple arsenal, mostly fastball and slider. When it comes to slider metrics, the expected batting average against is only 118. The expected WOBA is 165. And again, top 15 among starting pitchers who qualify in whiff percentage. So very, very solid pitch. He actually models the slider off of DeGrom from what I could find. And again, pretty close comp as far as not a ton of movement, but a very firm late break pitch. So let's now touch on his mechanics. I know that's what a lot of you guys clicked on this video to see uh, how exactly is he able to throw so hard with being you know, relatively undersized for a big league pitcher. But I first think it's important to go over his mechanics pre and post TJ. So he had Tommy John surgery in uh, 2019. He missed the 2019 season. Uh, this is his mechanics uh, in college in 2018. And you can see there's quite a few uh, differences, which we'll get into in, in a second. But he was a low 90s pitcher pre TJ. And after TJ, he was mid to upper 90s. Obviously, he's continued to tick up below as he's gotten into the big leagues and into pro baseball. But this is when a lot of his transformation happened physically, uh, psychologically, from a mental, mental standpoint. Um, he credits a lot of uh, where he is now with some of the changes that he made to his overall routine that happened uh, after having TJ. So that was really a pivotal, pivotal turning moment in his career. And we'll touch on that later in the video is how you can use major injuries or major setbacks as a, a kind of a positive and you know, what is the silver lining there to come back stronger and you know, be a better version of yourself. So um, pre TJ, some of the things that really stand out to me, one of the first things you see if we pause this is how long his arm action is. I mean, if you just look, look and compare how extended he's getting 
right here. And again, this isn't necessarily, you know, right or wrong. Long versus short. Long arm action isn't necessarily worse than a short arm action and vice versa. But um, just worth noting how stark of a difference this is. So this was something that he, he spoke about in a number of interviews where this was really a primary focus um, mechanically for him after having TJ. But again, first thing to point out, um, also notice the, the, the front side tilt. So his shoulder, he's significantly more tilted uphill at this point in the delivery. So as soon as he drops into his backside, you can see he immediately reaches up, shoots the glove side up, whereas he's keeping the shoulders much more level at this point, and he's allowing the glove to take a more uh, kind of neutral path into landing versus shooting that glove arm way up. And again, when this glove arm shoots up, the throwing arm is gonna tilt in response to that. And so you're typically gonna have the shoulder angle uh, shoot into this very steep shoulder angle. It's gonna be tough to get the arm back on time when your first move is to just shoot the glove arm way up. And so one of the main differences that I see is again, him being able to keep that front shoulder down and keep the trunk level and stacked as he goes into landing. We can also see how much more quad dominant he was pre-TJ. And when I say quad dominant, one of the telltale signs is the position of the trunk relative to the position of the knee relative to the position of the back foot. So a classic quad dominant pattern would be something like a front squat. So most of you probably front squatted. You can imagine if you have a bar on the front and you squat down, what happens? Your knees shoot forward, your trunk stays very upright. So the most quad dominant position would be knee way out over the toe and torso kind of back or very upright. Whereas a glute dominant position would be more of a hips back, knee back, not way out over the toes, but knee back and then a forward trunk posture. So we can see when we compare these two positions, immediately drops down into a ton of knee flexion and the trunk is relatively upright. Whereas again, starting to get a little bit more of a true hip hinge uh, with the brace. Now this is still what I would consider a little bit of a quad dominant, uh, slightly quad dominant uh, posture. However, one thing to note is guys who have extremely, a extremely strong lower half, extremely you know big or strong quads like they can still find a way to generate a lot of power even if their posture is a little bit more quad dominant versus glute dominant so it's again it's on a sliding spectrum it's on a scale where it's not glute dominant quad dominant nothing in between right he's probably a little bit more towards the glute dominant side now than he was um, but it's still more quad dominant than some other pictures that you might be able to think of so that's another big thing that that i noticed but how does this all kind of manifest itself later on in the throw so if we take him into landing, again, we know he's quad dominant. We know he's getting really uphill, uh, really tilted with the shoulders, really long with, in the back with the arm. So where does that actually manifest itself to where it's impacting his velocity? Well, we see it landing. Where's the front shoulder in college? You can see his glove arm has swung way out to the side. So he's really swimming the glove arm open and you can see where the arm is. Now the arm's late. Some might argue that this was you know, predisposing him for the Tommy John surgery, the, the torn UCL that he ultimately had that very next year. And that certainly could be a factor. It's gonna be hard to prove that. It's gonna be hard to make that, you know, firm argument and blame it on one mechanical factor for that injury, but that certainly could be uh, a contributing factor. Uh, the bigger thing for me is just from a, you know, performance standpoint, when the arm is down, when the arm is this late, it's not in a position to be able to accept that layback, uh, be able to accept that properly timed rotation from the pelvis to the trunk up into the arm. So there's this wave of energy going through your body. And when your arm isn't in a position to actually transmit that energy, when the arm's not up somewhere above 45 degrees to actually transmit that energy, there ends up being a lag or a hitch. And the arm is gonna be what takes up, um, you know, some of the stress from that lag, from that hitch. So from an injury standpoint, could be a factor, but certainly from just optimally transferring the energy through the body, through the delivery, that's likely a pretty major inefficiency right here. So um, you can see currently arm up in a much better position, right around 45 degrees. Again, somewhere between 90 degrees, 45 degrees, somewhere in that range right here is kind of what we're looking for. And again, way down, way below kind of that optimal angle we're trying to look for. Um, so that's really the biggest thing when we kind of zoom out and examine like, why does it work for some pitchers when they do shorten their arm path? The big reason, if you look at a lot of these transformations, Pete Fairbanks, Joe Kelly, typically when you look at the before video, when they had these really long arm paths, what you see is something similar. You see a lot of timing issues. Um, you see 
generally flying open and you see the arm extremely late in landing and not getting in plane with the shoulders. And so there's just a overall inefficiency. Now, can you specifically say that it's because the arm action was long? Potentially in some cases, but the, the bigger reason is they just found a way to get their arm on time and in plane. And so you can have a longer arm path that you get on time and in plane. You can also have a shorter arm path that you get on time and in plane. But you could also have a short arm path that's late or a long arm path that's late and that's not well timed. So this is an example of how shortening the arm path also happened and actually improving the lower half and getting more of a hinge happened to give his arm more time to get up and get in a better position and ultimately led to a velocity increase. So again, just important to note, uh, when it comes to post TJ, so we're gonna flip and go to this clip right here. Um, some of the things that he's uh, really improved and, and consciously made some of these changes. Uh, one, if we look at the lower half, we can see there's a lot of coil now. So as he lifts his leg, there's a pretty aggressive forward move, but you can see that the angle of his, of his cleat here his foot's facing pretty much straight back towards second base. So he's getting a significant amount of coil from this position. You're also gonna notice that there's a pretty substantial uh, kind of dip of the front shoulder. So this might be easier to see actually on the comparison. So right here, you can see as he lifts his leg, his front shoulder comes up. Here as he coils, he maintains this kind of downward angle. He coils and he has that slight dip of the shoulders. What that does is as he then drops into his back leg, he ends up level. So by kind of exaggerating with the coil, a little bit of a dip, Roger Clemens did this, like I've talked about this a bunch before in other videos, by kind of exaggerating with the coil, a little bit of a dip, and as he drops into his back leg, he ends up level with the trunk. When his first move is to immediately pop the shoulders up, then as he drops into his backside, it gets even more exaggerated, even more aggressive, and now he has no way to actually get back on time by the time he gets to landing. Why is the coil potentially helpful? Well, you can think of it as, for a lot of guys, they get a velocity bump when they add a coil, depending on how much mobility they have available to them. Because you can think about it as like winding the back, the, the back leg, winding the springs in this back leg. So as you coil into the back leg on a fixed foot, the cleats are gripping the ground, so you have a fixed point into the ground and you're coiling on that fixed point. So what you're doing is you're basically winding all the fascia, winding all the connective tissue, all the muscles in that back leg. You're winding the spring. And so as he drops down into his backside, he's able to create this, this rotational tension in the backside. And that's what's able to contribute to powering his, his hips, powering his lower half into this rotation. So that's able to contribute to this powerful unload of his hips, this position right here. Right, without the coil, he kind of just would open into landing. With the coil, he has something to power and pop open into landing because he's wound the spring of the back leg. So that's kind of my hypothesis and theory as to uh, why a coil for so many guys seems to ultimately lead to an efficiency boost and a velocity boost as well. Uh, also worth noting when it comes to the shorter arm path, one of the things he said when he was trying to figure out, hey, why did I get Tommy John? Why did I hurt myself? Um, what can I do to prevent that from happening again? He was looking for some sort of mechanical comp, some sort of guy to look at and say, um, you know, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, it was interesting because he actually used Trevor Bauer as a mechanical comp, at least from an upper half, from an arm action standpoint. And he had a quote in the one article where he said, for me to try to be Jacob deGrom, because he considered using Jacob deGrom as his kind of arm action comp. He said, at that point, it didn't make any sense. I'm not 6'4", I'm not long and lanky. I wasn't throwing 100. I was low 90s and shorter arm action. That made sense to copy Bauer. It was a lot of trial and error. So that just stood out to me because we constantly harp on the fact that like, if you're gonna use a mechanical comp and when we assign mechanical comps to athletes that we work with, it needs to be someone that reflects your, the basically available mobility, levers, general body type that you have for it to be a relevant comp at all. So he is intuitively aware of kind of selecting comps for what he's trying to work on. And I love how he mentioned trial and error there because at the end of the day, you know, we might be able to give some sort of informed uh, decision-making process but it's always a trial and error process. We don't have the magic bullet to fix X, Y, Z mechanical issue from day one. We might have an idea of what the flaw is, what our likely underlying cause is, and some contributing factors, but it's not like we can magically snap our fingers and fix the problem. It is ultimately a trial and error process that you have to have the athlete and the coach collaborate on addressing. So I love that he mentioned that 
when it came to actually shortening the arm action and having a, re a reason and a rationale and a hypothesis for doing so. The other thing to note is that he actually is significantly more cross body now with his stride direction than he was before. So his initial stride direction pre-TJ was actually pretty much in line with the target. And you can see now at this point, he has a pretty decent gap uh, where he's striding a little bit cross body. Now, a couple things to point out. One, a lot of coaches will see something like this and they'll actively uh, push guys towards having to be completely directional. Uh, for certain guys though, it works to end up being a little bit cross body and provided they have the mobility, both in their hips and also in their spine and their upper half to pull it off, um, it can be a really effective uh, strategy for a lot of guys. So when we see someone that's having success, they're throwing hard, they're able to properly block the lead leg and they have the mobility to pull it off, uh, we typically won't touch that. Uh, even if it kind of emerges naturally as a byproduct of changing something, adding some coil, adding a little more sit in the lower half, adding a little bit more of a hinge position. Sometimes guys will naturally tend to be more cross body and if it works, we're not gonna touch it. Uh, so that's the first thing. And again, I already kind of alluded to it, but um, for certain guys, if they get cross body, all it does is lead to a breakdown of their blocking angle on the lead leg. To be able to pull that position off when he's way across his body, right, he's gonna have to have the hip mobility and the thoracic mobility to actually get around that angle. Some guys just get to that position and they just block off their rotation and they feel like they get stuck. And the knee shoots out to the side, the ankle rolls out and they end up just throwing slower as a result. So this is a very individual specific thing where sometimes it will just kind of emerge as a phenomenon that happens and you need to know as a coach or as an athlete when to touch it, when to address it, and when to kind of just sit back and let it happen. The next piece that you know most people uh, kind of recognize Strider for is his pretty aggressive uh, recoil. He almost does like a pirouette sometimes as he follows through. This is not something he seemed to do as much pre-TJ when he was throwing in the you know 90-94 range. So what exactly is happening there and what's kind of the rationale for why that's occurring? Now really when we, when we think about the recoil, uh, what we're looking at is an efficient deceleration sequence. So it's not just about accelerating as fast as you can. The pitchers who you know just focus on acceleration and they don't have a good decel path, right? They just continue to rotate and they just continue continue to rotate. What you actually want, if you think of a whip-like mechanism, there's the initial acceleration phase, but there's also that final crack of the whip where there's a there's a pullback and there's a deceleration from the proximal uh, you know flicking of the whip. And it's that pullback, that deceleration, that shoots that loop of energy, that shoots that, that wave of energy down to the tip of the whip. And so that's ultimately what a proper uh, deceleration is doing. It's being able to create very violent hip rotation and then stop it at the right moment. That shoots the trunk forward, stop it at the right moment, shoots the arm, catapults the arm out and around, stops it at the, at the right moment. And so that's what a very efficient deceleration uh, looks like where there ends up being this kind of violent recoil-like action from pitchers that have efficient deceleration sequences. So Strider, again, Dustin May, Jordana Ventura was known for that, but a lot of very hard throwing pitchers are known for having this recoil-like mechanism. And there are coaches out there, and we've used this before, who actually use the cue of try to pimp the finish or try to recoil uh, as a way to improve velocity. And so for some athletes, that actually will lead to a velocity increase and improvement in their deceleration patterns. Uh, especially if they're just kind of not sticking the landing, they're not sticking the front leg, they don't have a good lead leg block. When you cue them to like pimp the finish, uh, a lot of times that will clean up how they actually accelerate by focusing more on the deceleration path, if that makes sense. So let's take a look, closer look at his uh, lower half drive and then also how his lead leg works. So once he gets down at a leg lift, he drops into the backside. Uh, you know, he's in a stable backside position. I wouldn't call this an external rotation dominant position, but I also wouldn't call this a very internal rotation dominant position. He appears to have good mobility uh, kind of all throughout his hip in both external and internal rotation range of motion. Um, so I would consider this kind of somewhere in between, similar to a Jacob deGrom, where it's not really biased in one direction, vertical tibia or super internal rotation dominant, but he's able to really hold this backside and ride it out down the mound. So being able to get into this position, right, I'm thinking of someone like a Chase Petty, where it's just the ability to continue holding the backside, holding the backside, holding the backside, as he keeps the upper half stacked, locked and loaded uh, over this back hip. So he's able to keep that head stacked over the back hip while riding and building tension and keeping that rotational torque in the backside, again, along this kind of stable, fixed back foot. Um, when we get to ultimately the, the unload into landing, 
from certain angles, it, it does kind of look like he gets a little pushy and a little extendy off the back leg. But from the side, you can really see that he's primarily rotating. And you can tell that from this knee angle right here. So with athletes that get super extendy from the side, you're typically gonna see relatively, again, extended uh, knee angle in this position. So it can be a little deceptive from a back view or even from a front view. It looks like he's getting kind of a little bit of a push, um, but again, it's more on kind of a spectrum where there's full on jumping off the mound, triple extension, completely cashed out extended back hip, and there's you know fully rotating, and then there's somewhere in between. It's probably a little bit towards the extension side, uh, but you can see right here, it's really not, uh, not that substantial as, at, at all. He's rotating very, very efficiently from this point. And so he lands in a good blocking angle. And from here, we're trying to observe what is the knee doing in multiple planes. So from this angle, we can see more frontal plane and we wanna see that knee stick and not continue drifting forward towards the catcher. And so he lands, boom, knee sticks, no movement here. And so he's got a stable platform for the pelvis to continue rotating around. So as the pelvis continues to rotate, this knee actually gets pulled into extension by that pelvis continuing to rotate around that fixed front foot. So now that the front foot is fixed, the pelvis continues to rotate. And as the pelvis continues to rotate, that glove side pelvis, so this side of the pelvis, as opposed to the opposite side of the pelvis, is actually rotating in a posterior direction, and the other side is rotating anteriorly. So the pelvis continues to rotate through, and as this side rotates through, it pulls this femur, which pulls this knee into extension. So again, he's not flexing the quad to create this uh, like pushing action into the ground. He's actually just firmly planted and allowing rotation to pull that knee into extension. And so he's a hypermovable guy, certainly in his lower half. He's got a little bit of hyperextension through the knee. Kind of reminds me of Justin Verlander from that standpoint. Uh, he's got extremely flexible hamstrings. If you've seen any videos of him doing some of his mobility work. And so he's fully putting that on display and he's fully leveraging his available mobility in some of these positions that he's able to get into and that he's able to sequence properly. Something that I kind of wondered when I was prepping for this video and, and just again, watching through videos of his uh, mechanics all, really all season was, you know, is he getting a little bit pushy? Is he, is he really missing uh, some of that scap retraction, some of that scap loading uh, that we, you might see in, you know, like a Jacob deGrom uh, type example. And when we look at an overhead view of him, he actually is still getting quite a bit of scap retraction. Now, maybe it's not to the same extent of a Jacob deGrom, but he's still actually getting quite a decent stretch through his upper half, through his pecs. Uh, but more importantly, if we look at the ability for him to dissociate uh, the hips from the trunk, He's got extreme degrees of separation, extremely good T-spine mobility, extremely good hip mobility, and just spinal mobility in general. We know he does a ton of spinal hygiene, spinal mobility type work, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but despite maybe not getting nearly as much crazy range of motion from the scapula as maybe Jacob deGrom does, he's getting a ton of it from other parts in his body. And so he's still able to really use range of motion to his advantage. We talked about the lead leg, we talked about the spine and still getting actually decent amounts of scap retraction, even though it might not look like it. Now, when we actually get to max layback, again, he's, he's demonstrating, you know, full 180 degrees of external rotation at the shoulder or very close to it. Um, he does get what I would consider a very, very slight uh, elbow climb and push. And so what you, can, what you can see from this is where is he hitting his peak layback? And I would say it's somewhere, somewhere around here. And so he's slightly out in front of his nose with that position where, where his elbow is uh, relative to this position. Again, I wanna take you guys back to this idea of, you know, it's not black and white, but it's really this sliding scale. There's maximum push where someone's out here, out way out in front with their throwing arm when they hit their peak layback. And then there's Sir Anthony Dominguez or uh, Jacob deGrom where they're really, really pulling into ball release and they're hitting their layback way back behind their ear, behind their nose, and they're getting this huge peck pull into ball release. So there's a spectrum here. Again, he's somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit more towards the pushy side, but it's not like your elbow or arm immediately blows up or you lose five miles an hour if you're you know, on slightly one side of the spectrum or another. So he's healthy, he's having success. That is not something that I would consider a flaw or has to be changed. It's just worth noting, um, you know, if someone came to me and they were having arm pain or maybe distal tricep pain, their velo was down, that could be something that you would potentially take a closer look at 
is again, where are they hitting their layback relative to their upper half, their, their head, their nose? Are they getting just a little bit out in front of the plane of rotation with their elbow at peak layback? Something else that he does, which looks a little funky, is kind of preset this back foot position out of the windup. Now it looks funky because most pitchers just start both feet facing forwards as they take their initial step, they find their foot position, and then they go. And we can see he prefers just to have a stable back foot position and know exactly where his cleats are in the dirt um, versus having to find that position midway through his delivery. Now, what's, what looks odd about it is a lot, of a lot of people just naturally would not be comfortable in this position because he is in quite a bit of hip external rotation and tibial external rotation. So for me, this actually isn't that comfortable of a position. My hips don't work that great in external. They work much better at internal. Um, so again, this would actually create a decent amount of torque on my knee if I were to preset that position. So, you know, I think for him, it's actually likely more just not having to find that back foot position in the middle of his windup. He can kind of just set it and forget it. But for a lot of people, this would not be a comfortable position. But as he actually goes into his initial rocker step, he turns his body position, he pauses for a second, and he's right in the same exact position that you know every pitcher out of the windup would be in. So whether you start facing the target, turn your body position, find your foot, and then go, or in his case, preset it, turn your body position, and go. Uh, what he's not doing is trying to rush through everything, preset it, and then trying to immediately go into his leg lift without kind of slowing things down, pausing for a second, it ends up being too many moving parts when you try to go from pelvis facing completely forward to a full coil. You're talking about a huge turn of the pelvis. Um, so I do like that he actually kind of gathers himself for a second, pauses for a second out of the windup, and then goes into his delivery after initially kind of shifting his body angle. So let's just touch on the overall uh, smoothness and, and rhythm and, and why exactly does his delivery look so easy. Now, this is something that you'll also notice when you look at other high efficiency pitchers. So smoothness is actually a sign of high efficiency in the overall sequencing, the kinematic sequencing of their kinetic chain. So how well do they minimize energy leakages through their body, uh, both from a linear and a rotational standpoint? And it's visually and aesthetically pleasing to watch uh, when there's high mechanical efficiency and there's minimal energy leakage throughout their entire body. So Jacob deGrom would be another great example. You're watching in, in this case, slow motion, um, but even in real time, you're watching how the energy just seamlessly transfers its way through the chain. And so it's aesthetically displeasing when we see a stabby arm action or when we see the elbow just yank inside 90 degrees from the bicep, or when we see the elbow just shoot way up above 90 degrees uh, at landing, or when we see that front knee cave in, it's not aesthetically pleasing because we're able to intuitively kind of feel the energy transfer and feel the smoothness of their delivery. And so this effortless velocity phenomenon is almost reserved for the most mechanically efficient pitchers where there's just this, this effect where, again, they are trying. He is trying to throw very, very hard, very, very aggressively. You know, if not 100% effort, I mean, he's up there on 100 plus mile an hour pitches, um, but it has this cool phenomenon of seeming effortless. And that's a result of the mechanical efficiency of how he's sequencing all this energy throughout his body. So let's talk about some of the other adjustments that he made uh, after initially injuring his UCL and going through this TJ rehab process. One of the things that constantly kept coming up in interviews, articles that I read about his experience was addressing the mental side. So addressing the sports psychology uh, side of the equation. Now I love that he mentioned this because we constantly evaluate our players, not just from a purely mechanical uh, kind of isolated standpoint, but being able to look at it from the entire performance perspective or the entire performance pie. Again, it's something if you follow this channel for any length of time, you'll constantly see me reference this, this pie chart where there's a ton of different variables that aren't all just purely associated with velocity or throwing or mechanics that go into performance. And the sports psychology, the mental side of it is a big one. Um, so he mentioned some uh, some pretty cool things that, you know, most of you guys will have heard over and over again, but it really comes down to, are you really implementing these things in your actual routine? Are you taking them to heart? Do you have some sort of uh, practice or routine or, or daily, uh, you know, tradition that you go through to be able to work on these things? Um, so he talked about the importance of building a routine of uh, controlling controllables. I'll read a quote from him in a second. Uh, he talked about doing everything with a purpose and understanding why each piece of your program is in there. And in doing so, it kind of empowering you to uh, be more bought in and, and be more focused and intent on every single thing that you do. Uh, he talked about being process oriented, staying present, uh, 
And you also touched on having an outlet beyond baseball, being able to unplug, be able to get away a little bit, uh, so to speak. And that's something that I know a lot of us can struggle with at times. Uh, he talked about the importance of keeping a journal. Uh, he also talked about dry reps. So using dry reps, he got that from uh, Kershaw. Again, I love Kershaw. I love that practice of using, actually getting on the mound on and off there on the day before a start and pitching an inning, pitching a simulated inning, moderate effort dry reps, low effort dry reps, and just psychologically going through it so you can feel like you've been there before. Uh, so this quote from him, he said, as a starter, I like to go down to the bullpen and just take a breath, get on the rubber just like it's a game and just go through some pitches. Uh, just pretend that I'm locking right into that in-game routine and then the next day it sort of falls into place. So the next day, it's not like it's been five, six days since you last threw because the very day before you threw a simulated inning. In your head, you already threw an inning and so you're mentally prepared because you've been there before. Uh, I thought this was a pretty cool quote from him uh, talking about being able to control the controllables uh, after Tommy John surgery. So uh, he said, when you get hurt and you're 21 years old and it's your draft year, there's a real realization that man, this is it. This is a pivotal moment. When that happens, you can either sort of lie to yourself and think that everything's going to be all right and just kind of hope and cross your fingers and leave it in other people's hands. Or you can really buckle down, be honest with yourself and say, here's what I need to do. Here's where I'm not good. So in his mind, really being able to identify, use injury, use the setback as a positive, put a positive spin on it, find the silver lining. What can I do to improve? What can I do to come back a better pitcher? That's the very first thing we do when we have an, any sort of athlete dealing with an injury is reframe it mentally and have a plan of attack to come back a better version of yourself. He also mentioned that may be the guiding perspective behind my day-to-day -day behavior and activity, but ultimately it's just what can I control? And that's getting healthy. That's maximizing my work every day, sticking to that process. And so eventually you trace the steps back to, okay, here's my goal. Well, what do I need to do to do that? I need to play well. To do that, I need to be healthy. To do that, I need to have a good plan. To have a good plan, I need to execute day-to-day. -day. So again, it just comes back to controlling the controllables, having a plan, having a process, um, and again, just seeing him you know, say all these things and knowing it's a lot of what we talk about and preach with our athletes on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's pretty cool to see him having the level of success that he's having uh, this year in his rookie season. When it comes to his training routine, I uh, couldn't find a ton of information out there. Um, it's certainly something where I love to get him on the podcast and pick his brain just like I did with Ben Joyce to figure out more about his own metrics and his own training style. Um, but there was some, some stuff out there that I could find, so we can touch on those. Um, one of the things I saw was that from 2019 2020 so as he was recovering from tommy john he really made lower body strength a priority now you can tell that kind of genetically he already is kind of built to have a strong uh you know stable lower half um, but but just even comparing his you know general overall size and development from pre-tj to post-tj to now um, it's clear that he's put some work in in the weight room um, i have a couple guys that have played with him uh, directly this season that say he's probably the biggest freak on the team from a strength standpoint, from a mobility standpoint. Um, so there is that. He certainly is an outlier in certain uh, genetic qualities, despite maybe not being, you know, six foot seven or anything like that, not having crazy, crazy levers. He is an outlier in other areas. And so again, it's just important to note, um, you know, some guys are just really good, you know, really efficient mechanically. And so that's where they generate everything. Other guys can make up for maybe being less efficient mechanically by being genetic freaks. And then some guys just kind of have all the above. They're genetic freaks in some capacity, maybe not as much in others. They also have extremely good mechanical efficiency. They also have great pitch ability. And so it's the guys who kind of come together with a bunch of different outlier factors. Those are the guys you see throwing 102 miles an hour, uh, like a Strider, like a Jacob DeGrom, like an Araldis Chapman. Um, I did find a quote from him where he said that he can split squat over 500 pounds. Uh, pretty sure that he's talking about Cal Dietz triphasic safety bar split squat where he is able to hold on to handles. He does do other triphasic Cal Dietz stuff. He does an RPR piece to his warm up, which is also from Cal Dietz. He does some spinal hygiene stuff. So really focusing on spinal mobility and generally controlling end ranges of motion. But yeah, that's a really good split squat number. Certainly it's it's not the strongest thing I've ever heard of, but it's that's a very good number. That's 90, 90th plus percentile uh, from a strength number on that specific lift. If in fact that it's a lift that he's doing, he does a lot of controlled articular rotation movements. So again, being able to control his joints at end ranges of motion. So again, it's not just about pure static stretching, uh, static uh, you know, flexibility. It's really about mobility. How well can you control these end ranges of motion? Again, something we talk about all the time. Uh, and then uh, we know that naturally he also has some degree of hypermobility. Certainly in his knee, you can just see that in his follow through as he comes through, as he blocks his lead leg, there is some hyperextension there. Would not know whether he has hypermobility in other joints in his body without doing a movement screen, but I would suspect generally because that is a genetic uh, thing, 
congenital laxity, and he's probably hypermobile throughout other parts of his, of his body as well. So from a training standpoint, he clearly has a plan. He's intellectual, he understands what he's doing. He's addressing the mobility side of the equation. He's addressing the strength side of the equation. I'm sure he's addressing the power side of the equation. He's training unilaterally. He's training in multiple planes. He's doing rotational movements. So he's doing a lot of the stuff uh, that we would recommend for pitchers to gain velocity and try to stay healthy. So uh, I think he's really got to cover. He's clearly working with someone who kind of is up to speed with a lot of these concepts in the industry. The next section, which I normally wouldn't talk about is touching on his nutrition. Um, but I wanted to mention, I thought it was interesting uh, because he, said in a number of interviews and articles that he's been a vegan now since 2019 uh, throughout the rehab process. Um, the main reason among others being that he has a family history of high blood pressure and he had actually had high blood pressure himself uh, in 2019 and when he discovered that he was looking for any uh, any quick fixes or dietary changes that he could make to help lower his blood pressure. Uh, again just because of that kind of high risk category and that uh, genetic predisposition that he already had. And so that cleaned it up very, very quickly for him. He feels good uh, just by incorporating more kind of plant-based sources into his diet. Um, I will just say that um, certainly there are some benefits that can be had by incorporating more plant-based sources, more fruits, more vegetables, eating less processed foods, uh, eating healthy fats. That doesn't require going all in 100% vegan to be able to achieve that. Uh, if you are going to be potentially looking into, you know, going full vegan, like it's something where definitely do your due diligence, talk to your dietitian, talk to your nutritionist um, before just diving head first. But generally just adding in more uh, plant-based sources to your diet, being able to address the micronutrient side of the equation, not just calories, not just your, your fats, your carbs, your proteins, but the micronutrient side, that's an extremely important and undervalued piece of the equation. And I think we can see you know, a lot of benefit that he certainly had, but athletes that we work with have had a lot of benefit uh, from just upping the overall intake of leafy greens, fruits, vegetables, um, things like that. There can be a risk uh, from an overall kind of amino acid composition with just going straight vegan and uh, ignoring animal-based uh, protein sources. So again, you just wanna make sure to do your, due, do your due diligence, talk to your dietitian before you even consider just like copying what he's doing. Um, that's probably not the main reason that he gained velocity, um, but it certainly was just an interesting point that I wanted to add in. So a couple of closing thoughts on Spencer Strider. The main thing that kind of jumped out to me just prepping for this video, because I've, I've never talked to him at this point yet, um, is that he seems to really be an intellectual and take his career seriously and really have that curiosity and that understanding of exactly why he's doing everything in his program. Um, you're going to have a ton of different coaches over the course of your career, especially if you make it into the, the higher college levels or into the professional levels. You're going to have a ton of different coaches all telling you different things. And so you ultimately need to be able to educate yourself, become your own best coach and be able to filter in you know, what works for you, what doesn't, and ultimately establish a routine that works for you. So it's really cool to, to see that, to see a ton of the big leaders that we work with, college guys, they're educating themselves, they're taking advantage of this information that we're putting out, this information that's you know freely available now, and they're really able to become their own best coaches. Um, so it's, it's cool to see that the players at the highest level, a lot of them are now this way, and it's not just purely a genetics game, and whoever wins the gen genetic lottery and can just you know grunt 100 miles an hour and not even think about it, uh, you know, are the best players on the planet. It's the guys that have a process, it's the guys that uh, really take that, you know, arch side of the equation to heart and they understand what they're doing from that overall performance pie perspective that we talked about. If we look at what he's doing from a diet standpoint, he has a purpose and a reason for it. If you look at what he's doing from a recovery standpoint, a lifting standpoint, a mobility standpoint, a mental game, a psychology standpoint, a mechanic standpoint, he could walk you through every single part of everything that he's doing in his preparation and explain the why. And so if you take a look at your routine and you can't explain not just are you addressing each piece of the performance pie, but why you're doing every single thing that's there, then you're missing out. And you need to continue to educate yourself as a player to get everything that you possibly can out of your body. The next point I wanted to make is, does Tommy John make you throw harder? And somebody might say, well, look at Spencer Strider. He was throwing 90-94, got TJ, came back, throwing harder. It's because he got TJ. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you listen to anything that I said today, the point is that he used this time down as an opportunity to continually improve and attack whatever his weak links were. He was ruthless in identifying, this is where I'm lacking. I have, a, I have to have a sense of urgency. I have potentially a year left until my baseball career is over. What can I do to make sure that my baseball career is not over a year from now? And so TJ did not make him throw harder. It was using that downtime to take a step back and readdress what he was doing in the mobility side, from his lifting side, from a mechanical side, 
All those things combined is why he came back throwing harder. So does TJ make you throw harder? No, but it gives you a year to use to address what you're doing on all these different facets. And if you use that time wisely, you may very well come back throwing harder. And then finally, are you guys interested in me potentially sitting down doing an interview with him to have coached players that he's played with or that he currently plays with? So that certainly is something that I can reach out and try to schedule if you guys are interested. I'd love to ask him about his routines, about his you know, lifting regimen, about his throwing regimen, about his feels, uh, about exactly what he's thinking about on the mound. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, drop a comment down below. Uh, I would definitely love to do that at some point in the future, but appreciate you guys sitting through this. I know it was a longer breakdown. Hopefully you guys took something away. Again, drop a comment down below if you have any questions. You can reach out to us at contact at treadathletics.com if you need anything. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.